Uh, before we have the distinguished lecturer and professor Johan Rockstrom, the known climate rock star in his research, uh, I would like to invite uh, just to give you some announcement how to ask questions, Andrea Dumitrascu. Andrea? Thank you so much, Elias, for, for the introduction. Uh, dear participants, thank you so much for joining. Uh, please, uh, in case you don't uh, use Slido yet, you can go on www.slido.com uh, and use the code digital for sustainability. There you can ask uh, questions or comments and we will make sure that we will uh, allocate them accordingly. Uh, as usual, uh, after the session, we will publish the uh, the video recording on the connect page on Futurium accessible for everyone. Thank you so much for this. And uh, Ilyas, um, I give you back the floor. Thank you, Andrea. As the introductory, uh, as an introduction to the seminar, I would like to call uh, our director, Gerard de Graaf, that is a director in DG Connect in charge of digital strategy and overlooks also the coordination of green and digital and green ICT in particular, but also other aspects like digital innovation, skills, uh, DESI among others, and the platforms, the hard work on the platforms. Gerard? Thank you very much, Elias. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to, to be able to be part of this uh, Connect University. Uh, I'm really also delighted to have Professor Rockström as uh, our distinguished uh, guest speaker. And I looked at the, um, the, the list of uh, participants and, and pleased to see that from all uh, director generals uh, across the commission, we have a very strong interest uh, in, in this, uh, this topic. Let, let me just make a few kind of introductory comments. Uh, and, 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 and first of all, I think to say that it's, it's really good that um, uh, the Commission has put um, climate, environment and digital at the top of the agenda. And not only that, that we are increasingly uh, looking at the synergies between climate and digital. So rather than seeing them as like two priorities, some way kind of independent, I think we're increasingly, and that's certainly one of the, I think, main focuses of today is how digital and, and climate can reinforce each other. Uh, I, I should say first that, I mean, we, we are kind of very committed in DG Connect um, and, and look at um, making ICT more sustainable. Uh, I think we have to admit that ICT is not clean. Uh, we've all been using, with the COVID crisis, a lot of, of ICT and, 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 and video streaming, etc. And, and this contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the estimates are that, that ICT is responsible for anywhere between 2 and 4 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. And the, trends is not, the trend is not good. So we have to really kind of uh, act in order to make sure that ICT is, is, is a, a part of the solution and not uh, a part of the, of the problem. So what are we doing in very concrete terms? What has the Commission committed itself to? Well, first, um, to make the infrastructure, uh, so the electronic communications networks, the data centers, make them much more energy efficient. Um, there is a commitment of the Commission to work and to implement policies to make data centers, which is obviously where a lot of the kind of what we do with video uh, and, 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 and data storage, that, that's where it all happens, that data centers by 2030 would be carbon neutral. And, and that's also in the interest of the industry because it, it makes for more efficient and, and, and also more competitive data center. So that's a very important strand of work. The same with the electronic communications networks, the, the 5G, the fiber, uh, etc. Also to make sure that consumers understand what the environmental impacts are of the services that they, they use. Uh, the second priority that we have is about material efficiency or inefficiency, particularly of digital devices. I think we all 
remember the time when, I mean, you had a laptop and actually it was with you for a very long time or you had a device and you used it until it no longer worked. Uh, statistics suggest that kind of until very recently laptops, the life of a laptop was 11 years. Today it's four years. The life of a, of a device is like a smartphone is 21 months. Uh, so we are, we have become a, a society of kind of changing very quickly, disposing very quickly of equipment that, that still works. Uh, and obviously that's also part of the business model of the, those who are producing these, these devices. That's not good for the environment. Everybody realizes uh, this very um, uh, low percentage of devices are being kind of recycled and, and reused. Uh, so it, this all contributes to an enormous mountain of electronic waste. Uh, and the European Union is the greatest producer of electronic waste in the world, about 21 kilos per person. Uh, and that is something we have to work on. We are working on a circular electronics initiative to extend the life cycle to make devices, uh, laptops, um, uh, more kind of energy efficient to, to make sure that they are more easily uh, repairable. And, and that would be a very important step forward. And, and interestingly, it's actually also what our citizens want. Uh, they want kind of to use devices for, for much longer, at least two thirds from a recent Eurobarometer survey, two thirds of European citizens uh, are not satisfied with the lifespan of their devices, they would like to use them longer. Well, that's kind of, in a way, the negative of, of, of ICT. That's where ICT contributes to kind of environmental problems uh, and, and to greenhouse gas emissions. But what I would like you to retain, actually, particularly, is also the positive about uh, digital and, and, and climate change and, and, and environment. Um, the the uh, targets that the Commission uh, has increased for carbon reduction by 2030, 55%, and then to carbon neutral by 2050. I mean, it, it, I don't think it's daring to say that they can only be achieved if we maximize the use, we unleash the full potential of digital. Even without changing very much in the way we live, but simply using technologies that exist already today, we can cut carbon emissions by 15%. And that, of course, is, a, is already a very important step in the right direction. I, I, it doesn't need a lot of imagination to think that if we are going to make our energy systems more performant, smarter, or our transport systems, or, or we're going to make agriculture kind of less uh, polluting using less pesticides and, and fertilizer, we need digital solutions, we need sensors, I mean, we need to put smart technologies like artificial intelligence into, into our system. So, and I'm glad to see that we are, uh, and, and our colleagues in, in other uh, directors general of, of the Commission are really working hard to mainstream digital and to make sure that that potential can be uh, unleashed, can be, can be realized. Well, maybe just the last, point I wanted to make is about circular economy, which, which is absolutely, that's where we want to go. I mean, we, are, we are kind of moving in that direction, that's the circular economy action plan. Also there, digital, just by, by way of example, in a, like an electronic product passport. And if every product had like an electronic product passport attached to it, you could really see where it comes from, where it's going, what's in it, I mean, how it can best be recycled, what can be reused, what kind of rare earth could be, could be used again. So also there for circular economy, digital could be an important enabler for, for kind of making sure that we continue to act within the boundaries of the planet. So this is by way of, of introduction. It's a very exciting field of policy. There is enormous potential that I think we, we, can, we can unleash and and I'm sure our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Rockstrom, will kind of talk about the, the, the interaction between digital ICT and, and, and kind of green and climate and, and, and in the context of the planetary boundary. So by, by just leaving it here, we're going to turn over to Professor Rockstrom. I know Elias is going to introduce 
Professor Rockström, um, we asked and hopefully also agreed Madame von der Leyen, who is giving her State of the Union speech at the moment in front of the European Parliament, is to stop uh, at the moment that Professor Rockström would begin his, uh, his lecture. So uh, I'm sure she will do so and then we can all focus 100% uh, of our attention on the lecture of Professor Rockström and then, of course, ask uh, questions uh, after and and I wish you all a very productive, very enjoyable Connect University session. Back to you, Vidyas. Well, Johan doesn't need much introduction, but uh, let me just uh, repeat a couple of things that you may have already known or others that do not know uh, work of Professor Rockstrom. He's a Swedish professor who was a director at the Stockholm Resilience Center at the Stockholm University, but he is now a director at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, based in Germany. <clears throat> he is a member of a mission board on climate adaptation and societal transformation. That's where we also meet personally, which uh, I follow. This is the Horizon Europe mission, one of the five missions. Professor Rockstrom is uh, well known for his uh, work that uh, he he did on the planetary boundaries. There was a team that he led that actually invented and uh, produced the, the ideas and concepts around the planetary boundary framework and proposed preconditions for facilitating human development at a time when the planet is undergoing rapid change. In recognition of this work, Focus magazine actually named him Sweet of the Year for engaging in exciting work in sustainable development. So we're looking forward, Professor Rexstrom, for your lecture, and then we will have, uh, I think, good half an hour for discussion. So thank you for coming, and the uh, floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ilyas, and uh, great to be here. And uh, thanks, Gary, for that very, very important stage setting on uh, the potential of uh, digitalization to work for sustainability, which I think is one of the uh, really strategic untapped potentials. And I'll come to uh, some strategic uh, guidance uh, along those lines that I hope can be helpful. What I'd like to do in the next uh, 40 minutes or so is uh, to give you a uh, a scientific update that can provide the, the scientific justification for an acceleration and amplification of the digital transformation for, for prosperity and equity for humanity's future on Earth. And uh, I think Gerard's reference to Ursula von Leyen was very appropriate. That it, it is a special day today uh, with uh, Ursula von der Leyen giving her State of the Union speech, which uh, we have behind the scenes been able to provide quite a lot of scientific insights for. So I can just share with you, even before she speaks, that we have quite high expectations. And let's see if, uh, if it uh, will deliver as, as we expect, actually, um, aligning quite, quite well with uh, the, the scientific message that we now need to cut emissions by half every decade, and I'll come back to that uh, carbon law trajectory. Now, to, to kick off uh, kind of a scientific assessment on the, uh, the, the enormous challenges we're facing of a rising turbulent world is, is very appropriate to do with, uh, of course, the reference to the key conclusion that was done already 10 years back, that we've entered a whole new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, where we are the, the dominant forces of change on planet Earth. And I do this because we have more and more evidence to uh, show quite clearly that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is not uh, a kind of a freak event of a zoonotic viral spillover in a wet market in Wuhan. It is a manifestation of the Anthropocene. It is part of the hyper-connected social ecological <clears throat> drama that is playing out in the world today, a rise in scale, speed, and interconnectivity, where we see just over the last 20 years, a rising frequency of zoonotic viral spillover from wildlife via domestic animals to humans, connected to human exploitation and unsustainable exploitation of natural habitats, and that creates risks that um, 
cause these spillovers, but then also are amplified by the by the globalized, hyperconnected world that we live in. And that everything that Gerald pointed out in the beginning on on the transition towards more circular, more sustainable, more efficient, and and more resilient business models is part of the investment to build resilient recovery after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, this has to be put in the context of what I think is some of the absolutely fundamental recent scientific insights of, of the incredibly precarious juncture we have reached. This is, I would argue, perhaps one of the most important scientific findings over the last year, um, published and, and led by uh, uh, Matteo Willett, one of my colleagues at the Potsdam Institute. For the first time, a climate model is run for the past three million years. So this is the whole Pleistocene period. This is over the 4.5 billion years of Earth's existence. We know that these last three million years is the period when, when our planet has been configured roughly as, as we recognize her today in terms of the continental composition, but also the physical and the chemical composition of the water cycle and the atmosphere and the biosphere. Now, what you see on the y-axis here is uh, average mean temperature on Earth and the deviation from pre-industrial mean temperature of roughly 14 degrees Celsius. So that's the zero line. I'll come back to that. Always the zero line is the pre-industrial level. And what you see here, in my mind, is is not only a, 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 a fundamental scientific insight, it is really a humbling, almost philosophical uh, hit right in the stomach. Because what you see here in green are the model runs that even when incorporating the physics from orbital forcing and, and major stress factors like volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and the oscillation between ice ages and interglacials, the Earth system has never exceeded two degrees Celsius over the past three million years. The white lines here, the black lines here you see are the validation points for these runs. Now this just shows that the Earth system is a self-regulating biophysical system that uh, self-regulates within a very narrow range of plus two degrees Celsius. We are in the warmest interglacial state and minus four to six degrees Celsius, we are down in deep ice age. And today, we have raised temperatures by 1.2 degrees Celsius through fossil fuel burning and land use change. We're following a trajectory that would take us to above 3 degrees Celsius in the next 80 years. So we are truly, you know, kind of experimenting in a blink of time, pushing us not, not kind of one or two million years back in time, but way beyond three degrees or three million years. In fact, the latest findings show that the reason why the Earth system is able to remain within this, this narrow range are these living biosphere feedbacks and the physical feedbacks in the Earth system. You've probably seen this uh, phenomenally important uh, piece of this puzzle, which is from the global carbon budget, showing above the X line our emission of greenhouse gases, in green, the, the exponential rise of fossil fuel burning and orange land use change. So these are the the roughly nine gigatons of carbon that we emit today each year. Then below the, the X line, you see the carbon sinks. So in dark green, carbon sinks on in the oceans and light green in land. And then in blue is the net, net amount of carbon dioxide that remains in the atmosphere, which is causing the 1.2 degrees Celsius warming so far. So simply put, if, if it hadn't been for the natural carbon sinks, of the planetary boundaries that are outside the carbon budget, we would have smashed through 1.5 already and would be well on our way to 2 degrees because 50% of our climate debt is absorbed by the Earth system. But the most, drama, the most dramatic inside of this graph is if you look carefully, the more we stress the system, which we're doing by exponentially raising our emissions, the more the biosphere is helping us, which is a proof that the planet has this inbuilt resilience of capacity to deal with stresses, which it has been doing for the past three million years in a very successful way, dampening and handling all the stress factors that in the past were natural and now are anthropogenic. 
Now, as if this was not enough, we know that 1.2 degrees Celsius warming in the atmosphere is, is actually almost like a misnomer in terms of measuring the stress factor. Actually, 95% of the heat caused by fossil fuel burning is absorbed in the oceans. So if you have 50% of carbon dioxide being taken up in the oceans and land as a reduction in climate forcing, moreover, the net heat that remains, 95% of that, is absorbed in the oceans. So here you have another piece of proof that the three million year phenomenal oscillation between this narrow band, plus two minus four, plus two minus four, is, is self-regulated through the resilience of the natural biophysical systems on Earth. And that to me is, is almost enough to, to recognize that, oh my God, if we are now approaching two degrees Celsius, a place we haven't been in for the past three million years, isn't that enough as, as, a, as a very strong signal that now is a time to deviate away from, from that planetary boundary point. Now, we have the evidence even going back to 60 million years. You may have seen this Burke et al. paper. I think it's a phenomenal, you know, pedagogic graph showing, you know, it's, it's a logarithmic x-axis. That's why you see the cuts in a little bit awkward way. But in yellow, you see the last 12,000 years. So this is the extraordinarily stable Holocene interglacial the period since we left the last ice age. And we have today, we know already today, 2020, September uh, 17th, reached the highest temperature on earth since we left the last ice age. So we're bumping the ceiling on a one plus minus one degree Celsius period that we've had the privilege of since we left the last ice age. Then you have the one million year oscillations, the Milankovic oscillations in and out of ice ages you see here which never exceeded two degrees. And then you go back to the Pliocene and the Miocene period five, 10 million years ago. And if we would continue as today, following the IPCC trajectories, you see furthest to the right, we are projected to reach between three to four degrees Celsius warming by the year 2100. And as you see the black line here, just proving that that would wind back the climate clock between five and 10 million years. So we would go we would go beyond the point of a recognizable Earth system. We would go beyond the point where we'd have any, any life similar even to our pre predecessors uh, way before we evolved into Homo sapiens. And that would happen in a blink of time. So that, of course, is just another piece of the element here why we need to understand planetary boundaries and why we are, for the first time as scientists, forced to research the following question. Are we now at risk of destabilizing the whole planet? And that, that's the drama we're in today. Now, as if that was not enough, two days ago, we got another uh, verification that we are in the sixth mass extinction of species on Earth. You probably saw the Living Planet report uh, confirming once again, it's been three confirmations since the IPBS global report just two years back, that roughly 70% of, of mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, reptiles, I mean, all the, the let's say, the, the top predators and keystone actors and ecosystems have disappeared since 1970s. So this is also undermining the resilience in the Earth system to both sequester carbon, but also deliver ecosystem functions and services to humans. So that's what, what takes me to, to kind of this, this pre, pre, kind of first intro here, that we have a climate crisis, we have an ecosystem crisis, but it's also interlinked with the health crisis, and that these are interlinked Anthropocene manifestations. And on the health crisis, I mean, just to verify what I said initially, we have data showing in, in, in the upper left-hand graph here showing how zoonotic viral spillovers have increased very significantly over the past 40 years. We have more and more evidence that when we penetrate natural habitats, you get more human collision with um, zoonotic viral hosts like bats and rodents and, uh, and primates. We have, um, so, so that's the, the links that I think are really important to bring with us. We're, everyone is talking about resilient recovery from COVID now. The question is, what does that mean? I would argue one of the key investments is to invest in sustainability. Now, on temperature, we also know that the, the track record is, is now very well 
uh, scientifically and unequivocally proven. The last uh, of the last 20 years, uh, 19 are the warmest recorded ever. The only one outside of 20 years is 1998. Uh, here you have the last 10 years, uh, the 10 hottest years on, on record. 2020 is going to come in, we believe, as a second warmest year so far. You may have seen a week ago that, uh, again, we have observations confirming that the IPCC have underestimated the pace of sea level rise, that we're following the worst case scenario, which would take us to one meter. And as you know, the accelerated melting of uh, ice in West Antarctica may take us even further. But most importantly, which is why the Fridays for Future uh, movement has such an important message to, to us adults, is that it won't stop there. It's not as if we can halt sea level rise at one meter. In fact, last time the planet was at two degrees Celsius warming, the, the sea level equi equilibrated at six to eight meters sea level rise. So it's important to recognize that, that uh, the fear here is that we press on buttons of irreversible changes. So sure, we have impacts. These are serious. This is, you probably see these NOAA assessments of the continuous impacts we're seeing at 1.2 degrees Celsius warming. These are incredibly important. What we read today in the California fires, you may remember we started this year with the Australian unprecedented fires. All of these are amplified by global warming. We have the bark beetle infections of um, uh, spruce trees in Europe right now, which is potentially a, a collapse uh, trajectory. We have the the permafrost thawing and the forest fires this summer in in uh, in the Arctic. So the impacts at 1.2 are getting serious and impacting social and economic development. But my biggest fear is is actually not the impacts we're seeing today. It is the risk of pressing on buttons of irrevers irreversible change. And 10 years back, actually just one year before the planetary boundary science was published the first time. So the planetary boundaries were, were introduced in 2009. 2008 was the first time a group of scientists presenting the so-called tipping elements in the Earth system. It was led by Tim Lenton, now at Exeter University, but also with John Schellenhuber, my predecessor here as director of the Boston Institute, mapping the big biophysical systems that regulates the resilience of the Earth system, the ability to stay within this Pleistocene, nice you know, plus two, minus four range, and that have evidence of tipping points, that they can go from being in a desired state for humanity in terms of dampening and reducing impacts to tipping over to self-reinforcing impacts. And of those 15, 10 years back, we did a revisit now just a few months before COVID-19 took off. It was published in Nature in November 2019, end of November, beginning of December, and what you see here is, uh, for the first time, our assessment that nine of the 15 known tipping elements are on the move. That we're starting to see signs that they are behaving, either that they're slowing down, or that they're showing signs of higher variability, or that they're showing signs of degradation. And just to give you a few examples, the accelerated sea ice melt in the Arctic is now at a pace that not only is at risk of having summer free ice by 2030, 2040, but also affecting the jet stream in the Northern Hemisphere, but most importantly, affecting, as you see in the arrow here, the Atlantic circulation of heat, the whole AMOX system, which is part of the Gulf Stream that makes it, for example, possible to live in, in, in my parts of the world in Scandinavia. But you also see that there's more and more scientific findings showing that the Atlantic circulation impacts the surface temperature in the southern ocean and can accelerate the melting of the plates and the West Antarctic uh, glaciers in West Antarctica. So we have these teleconnections between tipping elements that are on the move. Again, giving more and more evidence that being steward of the whole planet and staying with a safe operating space on planet Earth must be the guidepost for all economic development and, and I will come to that certainly also for the digital revolution that we are now embarking on. Now, one of these tipping elements is the Amazon rainforest, the biggest host of biodiversity on planet Earth, one of the big carbon sinks 
if we have reason to be concerned about the behavior in the Wuhan markets in China, I would argue we have equally big reason to be concerned about the resilience and stability of the Amazon rainforest and like other biomes, because they regulate the state of the whole planet and thereby the economy and social development at any scale. It doesn't matter if you're in a village in, in Burkina Faso or if you are in Berlin or New York, you depend on these systems functioning. 10 years back, there was science published showing that if, if the forest uh, is deforested to 40%, we may cross a tipping point, irreversibly pushing the system to a savanna. There was also science showing that if global warming reached four degrees Celsius, the system could tip. But now we see increasing evidence, of course, that these uh, occurrences interact. And um, as you may have seen, Carlos Nobles, the leading uh, Amazon climate scientist from Brazil, uh, one of the leading scientists at INPE in Brazil, together with Tom Lovejoy, one of the leading ecologists, recently put out a piece um, indicating that when deforestation interacts with global warming, we may cross a tipping point already at 20% uh, deforestation. We are today at 17. So this is just to show that, that it's not as if it's way in the future, these tipping elements. They are actually uh, real risks today. And then you might ask yourself, well, is this just a few groups of scientists coming with uh, some, uh, some scientific papers? I would adamantly argue no. I mean, of course it is, but, but I mean, I'm also trying to communicate with you that this is now um, establishing itself more and more as unequivocal consensus in the scientific community. And it's best represented in this graph. What you see on the left here is, is a, a document called United in Science. I would say it's like the most important science communication we've made so far in, in the modern, modern time that we have uh, uh, over the past 50 years at least. It was released uh, again just pre-COVID, um, General Assembly in the United Nations in September 2019, hosted by the World Meteorological Organization, the IPCC, and Future Earth. And it was an effort of summarizing our state of science over the past 20 years on climate research. What you see here is the famous red embers diagrams from four different IPCC assessments. So you see, first of all, three clusters here. The one to the furthest left are risks related to ecosystems, so basically pushing systems like the rainforest too far. In the middle cluster here is risks of extreme events like droughts and floods and heat waves. And further to the right, the most uh, important one, which is the risk of triggering um, singularities, meaning tipping points, irreversible changes. Now, on the y-axis here again is global mean temperature rise from zero to six. Each one of these columns in each of these clusters is one IPCC assessment. Further to the left, you have the third assessment. That's the state of science in 2001. Then you have the fourth assessment, 2009, the fifth assessment, 2014, and the 1.5 report in 2018. So again, 20 years of scientific advancements, or 19 years. Now, the darker the red, the higher the risk based on scientific evidence. And what you see here very clearly is that 20 years back, roughly, our assessment was that risks of large changes due to global warming was, you know, in the order of five to six degrees Celsius warm, basically saying that it was a zero risk. We, we had no reason to, to believe that we would reach five, six degrees Celsius warming. In fact, we're not even concerned about that today. But look at the trend line. The more we learn, the more science advances, and remember that IPCC is our, is our most authoritative, conservative, uh, scientific floor we stand on. I mean, if there's any critique you could give against the IPCC is that they tend to underestimate risk, not, not the other way around. The risk pattern, according to the IPCC today, is between two and three degrees Celsius warming. So basically, the more we learn, the more reason for concern we have. And I just want to emphasize, is this high risk of tipping points, of heat waves, of ecosystem collapse, because we emit more greenhouse gases? Oh no, it's not. This, this risk assessment has nothing to do with, with the Anthropocene or that pressures are rising or that impacts are rising. It's just that we learn how she operates. The more we learn of the self-regulating functions, 
in, in the physical and biological Earth system, the more reason we have to be concerned over crossing tipping points and the feedback that can accelerate a trajectory in the wrong direction. That is the conclusion. And that is what is now coming out very clearly. A 2020 version of the United in Science was published just a few weeks back, summarizing, I'm, I'm more kind of giving this as a reference because I think it's a great read, summarizing all the uh, climate impacts we see today, and you see some of the elements also related to long-term trajectories. Um, is this starting to be understood? Well, I would argue yes. I think we are at a very important turning point where the whole climate risk narrative and sustainability is changing towards being seriously considered and understood as something that we need to now invest in. So that's where the digital pathway is so important. Over 100 countries and cities have declared climate emergency. We quite recently put forward together with the Club of Rome um, the need to consider seriously the declaration of a state of planetary emergency because it's not only about the carbon budget, it's really about maintaining the resilience in the entire Earth system. This is starting to be understood in the business sectors. You've probably seen this famous graph of the World Economic Forum, which is the, the annual risk report, interviewing over 2,000 business leaders on the likelihood in the x-axis of risks for the business and the impact on the business. And as you know, today and, and several years in a row, in the green dots here, climate action failure, biodiversity loss, extreme weather events, natural disasters, human-made environmental disasters, really the, the whole complex around global environmental change is today perceived as the biggest risks we're facing, higher than terrorism, and actually even higher when this was published in January uh, 2020 than infectious disease and pandemic outbreaks. Uh, so, so the likelihood is, is starting to be understood. Uh, we're also seeing more and more, I won't go into that, but just have mentioned it, more and more indicative I say indicative because it's not fully established, links between global warming, environmental change, and destabilization of societies leading to conflict, displacement, and migration. And that this is a, this is a kind of a pattern we see in Mali, in Niger, in the Arab Spring, in, in Syria, in Sudan, in Afghanistan. Um, th these, are, these are worrying trend lines that are now being researched upon more and more. We have more and more economic research coming out. I'm just referring to papers coming out that the last few months, showing in this case that, that the actual impact of global warming on, on countries' GDP is not just in, in the, in the you know, singular percentages. In dark red here, you see countries that will have a more than 20% loss of GDP if we continue following business as usual pathways. This, this arises from incorporating the latest social cost of carbon and the latest damage functions into even conventional economics models like, like DICE. We have also much better analysis today on the social cost of carbon. President Obama in the White House applied 40 US dollars per ton of carbon dioxide, as you may know, as a shadow price of carbon. Donald Trump, of course, threw that out immediately when he took office. The latest science shows clearly um, that uh, 100 US dollars per ton of carbon dioxide is a minimum social cost of carbon and, and rising very fast if you really consider vulnerable communities, which just shows that if you would apply a price of carbon of, let's say, 100 US dollars per ton of carbon dioxide, you would immediately unleash a tremendous scaling of innovation investment and technologies, where the digital technologies would, of course, be a mainstay in that, because you would very quickly find that the old combustion engine type mechan mechanized technologies uh, would, would be kind of outcompeted. Now, let me then come to the final 10 minutes here just on where does all this lead us? So my, my key message to you is that the diagnostic today is, is more dire than, than we had even expected scientifically. So things are changing faster than we even uh, assessed that they would. We have, I would argue, an emergency point. The window is still open to transition towards a future where we can maintain uh, the remaining resilience in the natural ecosystems on Earth, 
and and uh, stay below two degrees Celsius warming. I don't think that that has been shut yet, but the window is rapidly, you know, the space is shrinking. Together with Jeff Sachs and, and colleagues at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, we quite recently published a paper on the six transformations that we believe are are necessary and potentially sufficient to, to reach all the 17 sustainable development goals. And among those 17, I include the Paris Climate Agreement as part of goal 13 on climate. And not surprising, of course, what you see here, that among one of the transformations is the digital revolution for sustainable development, that we need an energy transition, we need a food transformation, we need sustainable, resilient cities, we need equity and education, we need uh, health and demography, but all this is, is, is intertwined with, with the takeoff point we are in right now on, on the deepened digital revolution. I think this is one of the key messages from this work. I would add that now the challenge is to kind of cap these transformations within the safe operating space of planetary boundaries, to, to have a chance of having innovation and transformation delivering prosperity and equity, but within a stable Earth system. Are we in any way succeeding along that road? Well, you know that unfortunately the answer is no. This is a paper, if you haven't seen it, uh, please have a look at it. I'm, I'm, I think they've done a fantastic job. O'Neill et al. at uh, Leeds University published uh, a few years back uh, the paper with the fantastic title, A Good Life Within Planetary Boundaries. Now, what you see here is their assessment of all the countries in the world. How are we delivering on our good lives? Well, on the x-axis here, you have each number here is transgressing one boundary. So the further you are to the right, the more planetary boundaries you're transgressing. So you're going too far on climate change, overloading nutrients, losing biodiversity, degrading land, um, overusing fresh water, and over, overusing material flows in terms of rare earth metals. So, so the further to the right, the more unsustainable your country is. On the y-axis, you have just an addition of, of the attributes that we use for success and equity, life satisfaction, human development index, uh, life expectancy, nutrition, sanitation, income, you know, all the, all the things we want to score high on. So the, so the higher up you are, the better you are, the better outcome you are, have on the social side. And, and what you see is that here in that box, you have the OECD countries in the world, the the rich industrialized countries. So here we have the European countries. You recognize them. You feel uh, that's, that's where we're seeing the rich world. And, and so the, the key message is we are still 2020 in a mode where we are delivering on our social and economic aspirations by transgressing planetary boundaries. That's still the modus operandi of the world. Nobody is in the space where we want to be. Not one country. Vietnam is approaching. But otherwise, there's no country that can prove yet that we can deliver well on, on good social economic lives within planetary boundaries. That's our challenge. That's where the digital revolution needs to aim for. And I'm, there's no proof whether it can succeed or not. But there's therefore nothing that suggests that it couldn't play in that direction. You know this much better than me, that the kind of transitions we've had over different industrial revolutions. I just put this slide up to, to emphasize the fact that I think it's a very exciting moment right now. So it's not only a moment of grand potential existential risks, it's also a moment of takeoff point on exponential curves that can you know, help us transition and help us deliver better well-being for humanity. We have a, a, a more and more tools to get so I would strongly argue that one of the main messages in, in this talk is that please try to cap all the innovations in the digital space by science-based targets on planetary boundaries. One of them is, of course, uh, climate, and we've translated that to the carbon law. And the carbon law is inspired by the Moore's law. So it's inspired by a digital revolution in the speed of, of computer uh, doubling every 18 to 24 months that was stipulated 1962, I think it was, by Gordon Moore, which became, as you know, a self-fulfilling prophecia of innovation. The carbon law says if we cut emissions by half every decade, we can actually arrive in a safe space on climate. And we hope that that could be a scientific guide for innovations 
in the digital space. Now, this is based on the IPCC research. So you see the green line here that the world needs to follow, bending the curve of global emissions by 2020. So this is the this is the super year that was meant as the bending the curve year. COVID has um, impacted this, we can say, uh, say the least. But then also reaching a fossil fuel-free world economy by 2050. Cutting emissions by half every decade globally would take us there. That's why the Ursula von der Leyen statement today is so important. Will the European Union take the world lead on following the carbon law? That, that's kind of the, 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 big, the big moment today. There's so much data behind this. I just want to show that this is uh, uh, the, the carbon law trajectory following on the IPCC assessment. The reason why this has the, the additional colors is just a reminder as well. It's not part of this talk, but in dark brown is the food system, which is the single largest emitter today needs to become an orange, a major global carbon sink by second half of this century. In yellow, you have all the CCS and, and BEX investments that are necessary to stay within a safe carbon budget. And in green and blue are, are the carbon sinks, the earth resilience, coming back to the first couple of slides on, on what we need to maintain in the earth system to be able to dampen the, the stress that we have unavoidably already produced. So, so fundamentally, delivering Paris is actually a global sustainability transformation. It's not, it's not only getting rid of fossil fuels. It is, it is a full systems transition. That's also important to recognize. Can this be, be delivered? Well, we have been working a lot on something called the Exponential Roadmap, which was presented the first time in the Global Climate Action Summit in California, where I presented this with um, um, with Christiana Figueres, where we went through sector by sector to check with current technologies, is it possible to cut emissions by half by 2030? And we could show through a kind of a, quite a detailed wedge analysis that we can do this in, in essentially all sectors in, in society. So that's a kind of a, uh, a good message that it's not utopia to follow a carbon law pace, but, but digital technologies, uh, like I love this uh, point that you made, Garrett, about the, the electronic passport on, on all goods to, to show basically the life cycle and all the ecological footprint. I mean, we need those kind of innovations to be able to truly enable these, these wedges to be implemented. You've seen that, that we are following, in many cases, exponential roadmaps in a positive sense. This is just the global solar voltaics and wind trajectories we've seen and can see in the future. Uh, you see between 2000 and 2015, how we start from a very low level. I mean, it's less than 1% of the global energy mix and how it reaches 2 point something percent by 2015. That's the observed data. That's where the big energy utilities claim that, look here, we believe in global warming, but we will only aim at uh, providing cheap energy and, and renewable energy can never deliver at scale. Well, the, 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 why this conclusion is incorrect is that when, when innovations in the digital space and in any technology follows an exponential curve, it, it starts from a very low number and looks as if it's moving very slowly until it reaches the knee and starts rising very fast because it's doubling. In this case, between 2015, solar voltaics uh, is doubling every 5.5 years. That is a pace that if you just prolong that in a very careful analysis, you would find the curve, which is on top of that orange line, which would mean, can you believe it, that just following business as usual pace, that by 2030, in 10 years' time, we would have 50%, 50% of all electricity in the world from solar and wind. That would be business as usual. So, and, and of course, this cannot be succeeded without having digital networks that connect in a, in a smart way the grids to be able to, to unleash that scale potential. As a run-up to, to Ursula von der Leyen's um, uh, announcement today, there was the, the Moedas report that came out just a year back on, on the European transition. Just to say that also in the European Union, there's been a lot of studies showing that all European 28 countries in, in aviation, in rail, in heavy transport, can actually follow a carbon law and have 60% uh, 
reductions by 2050, which was one run, but even having a full decarbonized future um, as, as rapidly as 2050. So it's not as if we don't have solutions on the shelf, but I think that the, the digital technologies need to, need to play in here, weigh in, and be connected very tightly with sustainability. So I'm just closing by saying that science is stepping up to this. Uh, we have uh, an effort of setting science-based targets for all the planetary boundaries to be delivered for businesses and cities around the world. This is done through something called the Earth Commission to the furthest left, which is a, the first attempt to do a kind of an independent science commission on setting a safe and just operating space on Earth to be delivered into something called a science-based target network, which is defining quantitative science-based targets for businesses and cities to be rolled out around the world. I'd love to see these kind of science-based targets also to guide digital technology developments, to so always cap the innovations within a safe operating space of science-based targets. That, I think, is the only way to really deliver on the sustainable development goals, and that these have to be held together as one framework. And, and that is, I think, one of the, the key challenges for us, not to cherry-pick these goals, but to say that, of course, we want to have digital technologies to deliver on, on uh, poverty and hunger and well-being and economic development, but we have to do it in ways that keeps the planetary boundary goals here, which is six on water, 13, 14, 15 on climate, uh, oceans and land, uh, you know, as, as, as non-negotiable guiding posts. So my final slide is just to say that I think it's time to recognize that we in the Anthropocene, with the rising potentially existential risks we're facing, need to redefine sustainable development. That sustainable development is not only about reducing environmental impacts, it is really about development within a safe space on a stable and resilient Earth system. That, that we now connect people and planet in, in, in its full operational way. And that this requires governing the global commons within planetary boundaries, meaning that we're all interconnected on our very populated small Earth system. And I think that that has to be matched with the digital revolution that evolves within that space and that delivers to sustainability and kind of adds value without having rebound effects, just accelerating the path in the wrong direction. And I think, I think the potential is, is truly there. So put the sustainable development goals within planetary boundaries could be a kind of a guiding star, perhaps for, for, for the efforts of innovations in the digital space across all sectors. And with that, uh, I look forward to a um, discussion. Thank you very much. Over to you, guys. To remind everybody how it's going to work, my name is Ilyas Yakovidis, working in DG Connect with Gerard de Graaf that made the introduction. I'm coordinating this green and digital within the DG, but also having colleagues throughout the Commission and uh, working with Johan on the mission on climate adaptation. What I would like to make sure that you understand is that the slides and, this, and the recording of this uh, seminar is available on our website, Connect University website. After Janish last year that we had uh, hosted here and, and Luis Neves from Jesse, we, have, we will also put online the presentation and the, the streaming. So. Now let's go to the questions. You have already been active, I've seen on the Slido. There will be questions, and I see <clears throat> there are questions that are maybe closer to the expertise of Johan. There are other questions, how to actually green the ICT itself. I can help, uh, we will go through them and wherever needed, I can uh, complement if needed uh, some of the technical things we do with respect to greening the ICT. So let me start with the first question that is now uh, voted as a top question is the digital in itself has substantial effects on climate by use of electricity and cooling. If we go for a digital leap, how can this be mitigated? It's uh, one of those questions that I mentioned. I can complement, but uh, Johan, any ideas that you already have seen as best practices, others that have already went through this? Yeah, no, so um, there. I mean, this is clearly uh, one of the challenges. I, I think, I mean, theoretically, at least, uh, we have an opportunity here, which is that there's nothing 
hindering us to uh, have uh, uh, solar energy sources that are ample in, in, in size that can provide zero carbon uh, energy, I mean, cooling and electricity for, for the entire digital infrastructure. So that, that, that doesn't hinder us. The, the challenge is the, the transition. And the transition can be uh, very difficult if we start on the short term investing in fossil fuel based infrastructure to provide electricity and cooling for for digital infrastructure. So that that's uh, I think that's where we need these science based targets and a price on carbon to kind of avoid doing doing the wrong investments. Then secondly, and then of course you're you're a better place to answer here, but I'll give you a very personal example of, of the kind of innovation space. I mean we at the Potsdam Institute, uh, have just moved into a new research building, which is uh, having our ho hosting our supercomputer uh, in the cellar. And then we have had a so uh, supercomputer since since we were born as an institute, just emitting tremendous amount of heat, which uh, was just lost to the atmosphere. Now this heat is is used is the only source we have actually for cooling and heating the building. So of course. There are innovations here as well that I think one has to take very seriously in uh, in developing uh, many of these computerized uh, technology infrastructure that we see around the world. But Elias, you have other... Yeah, yeah thank you very much. I don't want to take too much time. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. At the end, if we have time, I will kind of uh, complement and if needed, I can send this and I put this online together with the the slides, I will actually try to answer some of these questions, okay? Uh, we have another question on uh, the funding, and that's that you know a little better. What can we do with our funds, with our twin digital funds? You know, you've seen us uh, now uh, working, uh, all of my colleagues that uh, are online now are working on how to s suggest to member states to spend their resilience and recovery fund and the multi-annual financial framework fund. What would be your suggestion? What, how should we prioritize this funding to, to achieve concrete, you know, uh, deliverables where digital and, and green twin together? Mm. Yeah, well, I would, um, uh, there, there's so many uh, candidate areas here, I think, but I think one of the most immediate and, and urgent areas is, is, of course, the transport sector. I mean, both both in the air and on land and on water. And I think to, to use the digital capabilities that are evolving to, to create smart grids for um, heavy truck uh, supercharging infrastructure and uh, uh, you know train networks and uh, different types of mobility facilities to reduce our conventional type of transport. So basically to, to plug in the digital capabilities in our whole mobility sector. I think that that's a that could be a phenomenal, a perfect timing, given that it's uh, so much money now put on the table, the 650, 750 billion euros, and the fact that the car industry in Europe and even the heavy truck industry in Europe are are very ready to uh, to move, uh, you know, quite fast is my assessment uh, along uh, new new kind of post combustion engine pathways. I think that is one area. But then I, I must say, I, I'm, I'm very convinced also that Garrett has had a really important point in emphasizing consumer goods and, and being able to use digital technologies to, to have a much better life cycle um, data analysis on you know where do products come from, what's the environmental costs, uh, what, what has happened when it comes to the to the import, uh, to, to, to the border. I mean, I, I think we, we, for example, cannot exclude uh, that we quite abruptly must start considering import tariffs uh, from, from countries that are not applying any kind of uh, price on, on environmental damage. And the only way to do that would be to use digital means today, because otherwise it becomes too cumbersome and has too much, um, too much of kind of Sorry, to too much uh, uh, kind of costs related to it. So I think that's that's a very important space because, as as you know, um, when you look carefully at the average European uh, citizen's emissions, it it may 
be in the official statistics four or five tons per person per year. But in fact, it's more than twice that because of all the, all the consumption, all the important consumer goods that, that are, are kind of added to, to the equation. And I think that that's a very important area. And then finally, just to say that I didn't mention that so much, but, but the food system is an equally important transition as the energy transition. And I think precision farming using digital technologies for you know avoiding all pollution from nitrogen, phosphorus, and chemicals, but also to decarbonize the whole food system is is another you know area that just opens up the whole space of, of innovation. And, and and I haven't even touched on on the whole computer industry and all of that. I mean, just just to take some of the basic sectors. Thank you. Now, I will, if time, complement a bit, a little bit about the product passport, because that's exactly what we want to do with product passport, not only to enable circularity, but also give the product environmental footprint. So the awareness of consumers is raised and we can support their choices that seem to go in the direction of buying more sustainable products. There's a question on carbon uh, capture and uh, storage that so far uh, there is a skepticism that uh, the only carbon capture and storage that really works is the photosynthesis and we are nowhere with this technology. What is your latest uh, take on this one? Mm. Yeah, this is a very, very um, frustrating uh, agenda point actually because it's not so well understood but, but it is a fact that, that there's, there's no IPCC climate scenario that takes us safely to Paris without including massive scaling of CCS. I mean, massive, I mean, up to 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. I mean, we emit 40, so, so roughly 25% of emissions would be, would be captured back through different forms of carbon capture and storage technologies. And today we're not capturing one ton. Uh, so it's a, you know it's it's a, it's a mega leap required. So so it is it is a very important but also frustrating agenda. But there is some some light in the tunnel. I mean, first I agree with the question that uh, we have a very a very efficient system for carbon capture storage, biological synthesis, but we cannot rely on it in full. We can use BEX biological carbon capture storage by growing trees. And, and cutting that biomass, regrowing that forest, and generating heat or electricity uh, with that biomass, and then and then sequestering it. That that is a very good technology, but it has limitations. It has limitations because of all the other planetary boundaries. So so that I don't see that as being uh, a, a road to to deliver those up to ten gigatons. But the good the good information is that. We have the technology, actually. We, we know how to do CCS. I mean, the, the basic, even retrofitting of coal fire plants and um, taking out carbon dioxide, concentrating in liquid form and pumping it back down into the, into the geological rock bases is, is the technology that exists. I mean, the oil industry has been using it forever to, to keep pressure up in their, in their um, oil drilling Holes and uh, uh, the, the the challenge is the price on carbon that is too expensive, and it's um, if if we would have uh, a high enough price on carbon, either coal industry would would uh, would go bankrupt, or it would have to install CCS, and um, and that is possible to do. I mean, we have uh, several facilities here in Germany that have been piloting this uh, for over twenty years. But but they're now they have been phased out because they were so so expensive. Then of course we have more innov innovative technologies as well, like accelerated weathering and silicate weathering that you basically grind down rock to absorb chemically carbon dioxide. These have not been tested. I totally agree. I mean there there are some ideas which are are theoretically put forward by by uh, scientists in different scenarios, but they have not been tested. But I, I think we can do much, much more on, on CCS, and I think we don't have a choice. I mean, I think we simply must get that price of carbon in place and start recognizing that, particularly China and uh, India, but also, I mean, Canada, 
some of our countries in Europe, Poland, the Baltic states, I mean, Germany still. Uh, I think either either need to phase out, as Germany is now trying to do, or we'll have to pay a very high fee for that, or we'll have to install CCS. Thank you. That's very clear. The next question needs a little bit of a, let me give you a, a little bit of a background. ICT per se has a positive uh, link with the SDGs overall. And so 11 of the SDGs, 17 SDGs, we have a positive relationship. We're actually helping them to happen. Five of them, it's unclear, and those are mostly the environmental SDGs, like climate action, life underwater on land. There is one that we actually have a negative relationship, and that's the responsible consumer uh, consumption and production, the SDG 12. The question that comes in is here, how can we flip that? How, what kind of purpose we need to give to digital development and directionality to help the to kind of mitigate the unsustainable production and consumption? Uh, I can again later on give you examples in the area of uh, consumer good and electronics, for example, but uh, anything that you would like to add to this? Yeah, no, I, I think this is, I, that, that's a very important assessment you yeah. there, and um, uh, that, that um, the assessment is that digital solutions have a negative relationship with, uh, with the consumption production goal. And I, that, I share that assessment. I think we, uh, we, we don't like being reminded, but, but the fact is, that if you look very carefully over technological advancements over the last 50 years, which have been phenomenal and have had tremendous positive impacts on human well-being and, and life expectancy around the world, have all of them had rebound effects where on aggregate we have just increased our impacts on the planet. So it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunately so that even if we get cheaper technologies and more efficient technologies, and there might be per unit area or unit kilowatt or unit water much less impactful on the environment. Just the fact that we thereby make them accessible to so many more and that we ourselves per, per capita consume so much more, the rebound effect is that we consume much more. I mean, the classic examples is, is refrigerators, which just through the efficiency of refrigeration means that they've simply increased in size. Uh, over the last 30 years, in, instead of uh, uh, having us, you know, capping ourselves to, to have a, a lesser impact globally. How to solve that? Well, I, I, the, the only thing I can think of is actually my overall uh, conclusion from this talk, which is now we are at this takeoff point on digital technologies. We will start to see, we, will, we see this already, and we'll see increasingly how digital systems, digital products, digital uh, technologies will penetrate our lives more and more and more. And I think they have to be guided by science-based targets on, on planetary boundaries, basically saying that every technology through its lifeline, so basically through that uh, digital passport, uh, avoids contributing towards, on the aggregate, adding negative pressures. And I think circularity is one part of that, because... I think one shouldn't be naive to think that uh, we will stop consuming metal and rare earth metals and, and different chemicals and, uh, you know, consumer goods will continue expanding. The challenge is to design them along value chains in ways that we can recycle them or we can keep a circular model for them. And that we've always, we've kind of known this for a very long time, but we've been very bad at scaling that and, and the digital world we live in can be a mechanism allowing ourselves to go to scale because instead of having this this tendency that we today do things in isolated pilots but we can in digital means make make the world much smaller and much more rapidly interconnected and thereby also potentially make uh, you know, digital solutions for circularity much more mainstream, faster. And I think that is what we need. 
There is a question that I will kind of rephrase a bit, but what do we, what can ICT do to convince the decision makers and the society that we need to follow carbon law? Do we need more health data, environmental data, transport data, energy data? Do we need more data? Is it, or are we in the phase where global leaders are like, don't confuse me with data, you know, and we didn't, we need something else. Yeah, I think ICT plays already, but but must play an even more important role. And I think um, my my assessment is that, well, I, I would not be, <laughs> I kind of, I would almost be disqualifying my, disqualifying myself in my own uh, profession if I didn't say that more data is good. Um, you know, as a as a as a data nerd, of course, data is good, and I actually mean it. I think uh, one should not. Uh, shed away from the tremendous value of having real-time big data on what's happening in our in our interconnected Anthropocene world, and that we should simply continue along that path. I think that is uh, incredibly valuable, and get more and more ICT solutions that that can reach out to more and more people on on not only what's happening with the world, but what are the solutions for the future. But then. I, I have another kind of ICT uh, trampoline, which, which I, I think is, is fundamentally important and is also a bit of a disappointment because today we know that um, uh, we, we, can, we can penetrate the world so fast thanks to the ICT highways we have. And we do talk about this in very negative terms. We talk about it in the, in the climate analytics term. We talk about it in, the, in terms of fake news. And we talk about it in terms of all the problems with Facebook and Twitter. But we, would, but we never talk about it in terms of, you know, what, what if Google would simply decide, okay, from now on, we're going to uh, engage fully in, in stabilizing the planet. And therefore, we're going to basically in a, in a very sophisticated way, just, just fold into all our platform communication with every user in the world, science, scientific messages that, uh, that helps us understand the risks we're facing and the pathway that we uh, can follow. You know, just, just to engage a bit more actively on the ICT, and I'm thinking of, of uh, you know, the big internet, uh, but also social media. I'm thinking about Facebook, Amazon, Google, you know, all the big digital giants. And we have actually had dialogues with them about this. And, and they express a kind of enthusiasm individually, but, but are very difficult to get to, to move. But I can share with you something quite excited. We signed that yesterday, actually. So it's very fresh. So Facebook is, as, as you all know, um, you know facing some, some challenges when it comes to how, how many subscribers are misusing the platforms for different uh, segregating and, and kind of really you know, kind of unacceptable immoral messaging. But now they're, they're taking a step to create a, a climate science portal where every, every Facebook user Will, will receive climate science information because they've experienced that Facebook is used to such a large extent to spread climate denialism and, um, and that they are concerned about this. So it's a way of showing that Facebook, um, they, they, you know, the, 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 the freedom of speech applies and everyone can, can use Facebook, Facebook to, to express themselves in whatever way they want, but Facebook will always on, on, on every account always uh, give give the truth and, and I think that's that's one little step along using ICT more actively to uh, to reach out much much wider than, than we can do as academics I would I would actually call it a huge step I don't know if and who has seen a kind of a new uh, Netflix uh, movie called the uh, social dilemma where ex, uh, you know, uh, CEOs of uh, the platforms you mentioned uh, talk about the business model and how the fake news propagates and makes money six times faster than the truth, which often is boring. So, coming up with such a 
science-based uh, platform and kind of, you know, like putting this data, it's kind of a huge progress to me. So that, that's a good development, but it's also a challenge for Gerard who, who now works uh, on our uh, platforms and how we can regulate the platforms, how to also take this to, into, into account. There is a next question, and that actually is, uh, there are several questions that I can put together, is that we, we see that the companies are racing to pledge to become green. I personally talk to them and I'm trying to create some kind of a club of like-minded leaders in the green and digital. Uh, they really racing, but do you see that we actually have a methodology where we can say this is the net impact of X technology, in this case, digital? Uh, and what would you suggest? How can we get there? Because we see that everybody claims that my technology and my product will save the planet, but we need something that we actually can trust, be consistent, standardized. Uh, would you personally suggest the organization that I need to involve to get there? Yeah, I think there's a big need here. I, I do not think that's a, that's, um, the positive or the like make make a, a full a full environmental impact assessment in a proper way on, on kind of ICT solutions. I think we need more work there, and I think it's um, and and then particularly because of our challenge of doing the full value chain assessment. I think that's the dilemma that <clears throat> many companies. There is a race, you're right. I think that is extremely positive. It's certainly not a race among all companies in all sectors, but but we're starting to get a critical mass, I think, in, in all sectors. Um, and then we have to continue accelerating, but still it's starting to happen. I think supporting that with, with credible assessments on how ICT solutions impact along its entire value chain, I, I see that still as a gap. So another question would be, can we decrease any human-induced warming effect while increasing our global energy consumption? I mean, can how this decoupling can happen? What about thermodynamics constraints? Mm. Yeah, so, um, so the coupling is, um, let's say, the, the holy grail that... Um, Many have been kind of a, a branch that, that many have been holding on to for a long, long time. I still think that theoretically decoupling is is possible. I think it's also our future because I think it's it's. Uh, I do not share those who who claim that degrowth or or some kind of uh, major reductions. In energy use is is the is the way forward, and, and the reason I say this is that, uh, however we twist and turn this, we we have entered the decisive decade where we in the next ten years need to to start changing things in a, in a dramatic way. I mean, we we need to have a world that follows the EU pace of cutting emissions by half. So we we cannot we just cannot wait for 8 billion people to be aware and on, on board and support support the cause. That has never happened. In fact, we have very, very much empirical evidence to show that even in the best societies, um, like many of the European societies, you, you, you never come more than 20%. I mean, in Germany, the Greens are a bit, you know, close to 20%, but 80% of the population remains quite indifferent. It's not as they're against sustainability, but they are not very engaged or willing to, to sacrifice in, in any way. And that can be understood. I think when one sees that in, in all technologies, in all transitions, and it's not something specific to the environment in any way. But it's also an opportunity because it means that these that, that this this indifferent majority can be very easily budged in any direction. They they can they follow the the path of least resistance. And, and therefore, I think we need to decouple. We need to be able to provide renewable energy, cheaper competitive renewable energy, as a, as a, as a substitute to fossil fuel-based climate damaging energy. And that that makes it much easier to get the indifferent majority 
to step on board because they will simply just be sustainable without even realizing that they're sustainable. I mean, that's that's the breakthrough point, I think. And thermodynamics, you write, be a residual. Um, you know, the, the more people we become, the more activity we carry out, entropy will play out. There will always be uh, a certain level of impact. And I, there are some assessments on this. And I think one just has to also recognize that, you know, we are not only a species on planet Earth, we are the dominant species on planet Earth. And of course, even if we are fully sustainable, this will have a cost. It will have a cost in terms of carbon in the atmosphere, land in the biosphere, uh, nutrients and fresh water. There will be some impacts on planetary boundaries. So we will never be able to uh, kind of reinstall a virgin planet, but the but the best outcome is that we have a manageable planet. And, and that, that, I think, is quite important to recognize. Now, have we been able to decouple so far? The answer is no. Uh, when you look carefully at the data, we don't have evidence of successful decoupling. I mean, some countries claim it, and the number one country in the world claiming it is my own country. That's why I can say this with quite some emphasis. Um, Sweden, because on, on, on paper it looks quite quite convincing, economic growth increases and emissions have been decreasing since actually since the 1990s. But the reality is that the per capita emissions continue rising. If you take the, your digital passport, basically, but doing it manually on all consumer goods, uh, the modern economies continue increasing with economic growth. It's still a linear relationship. And, and we are starting to see some, in some sectors, it's decoupling. That, that should be said. I mean, in, in, the, in the heavy industry, uh, we have possibilities in the transport sector, but it's, but it's not yet conclusively shown that we're doing it. But I think it is possible. I don't think there is a to close. I don't see a hinder for us to uh, provide zero carbon energy to a sustainable modern world with 9 billion people. I think, I think that is possible to do when you look at at the at the data at hand but it will require massive investments in, in wind solar hydro uh, I, i'm quite sure that hydrogen will play an important role i don't even rule out uh, keeping existing nuclear and then we may see some some developments there but i'm i'm, I'm very careful about nuclear but i, I, I see that this is is a possibility. And, and interestingly, the same is the case for the food system. We have a lot of evidence today that we can feed humanity with healthy diets within planetary boundaries. Um, there, there, is, there is, again, there will be some, some entropy and, and thermodynamics plays in, but, but we can avoid destroying the remaining biodiversity, for example, on Earth. We can feed humanity on, on the land that we have already put under the plow, so to say. So it, I don't think it's pitch dark, but it's, uh, it's very challenging. And uh, if you have any evidence on decoupling, please send it my way. Yeah, this is uh, our holy grail, my personal search as well. We're looking at some sectors, so let's be in touch on that. We are approaching the end and there are still a lot of questions. So I'll select three. You can either quickly go and kind of measure through them or just select one. So one is uh, coming back to your comment on, uh, prof you know, the sustainability will not happen if it's not a profitable business. So we also have to make sure that people don't pay more for it. That's why they maybe 80% are kind of agnostic or don't care because the price is still the dominant factor in their choice. So do you see already uh, good examples or methods of somebody suggests digital green currency or some kind of tokens? Do you see ways to to stimulate more and to compensate either through carbon tax or other ways uh, this profitability of this uh, of the green and sustainable business models and products? There is another on the limits of circular economy. I mean, what do you expect? Uh, how fast can a really circular economy transition happen? We will still need a lot of raw materials. We will be dependent on third countries. There will still be a lot of environmental damage. Where do you see kind of a balance uh, or where the curve will kind of stop rising uh, in your view? 
And the, there is a question on on AI and energy, but I can answer that. So I can actually do that either if the remaining time or in writing. So, and the, uh, yeah, the third question would be the CCU versus CCS. So carbon capture and utilization, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, versus storage. Jan. Mm. Yes, yeah, so on the, on the first question, I mean, there has been some interesting pilot projects on trying to, uh, uh, for example, there was a Dutch project which I thought was really neat to give a, so a kind of a credit card to, to people to basically have a set of points on, on allowable carbon units. So basically you get a carbon budget per individual or household. And every time you consume, um, the, the the number of carbon points are deducted depending on, on, on what could be done with that electronic passport, and, uh, and that that would be a way of uh, then if you exceed your budget, you can then go out and buy additional points, and you could buy it from uh, you know pensioner X who is perhaps saving some of her points. That th these kind of pilots have been done in some transition towns and some. In the world, but I have never seen anything go to scale on this, and, and I'm less convinced today. I was very enthusiastic with these projects for a few years back, but I'm, also, I'm less convinced that they can scale in time. So I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that combining, you know, political, regulatory, no, so a combination of three things. One is setting targets basically saying, okay, we're going to have a zero net emissions in 30 years' time, in 10 years' time, we cut emissions by half, like the European Union declaration today. Second is, is to have regulations. We need to have laws in place that, that basically uh, gives, gives, you know, basically legal, legally binding, um, that, that is, uh, that you can follow up and, and we have imposed uh, penalties on when it comes to transgressing environmental limits, and then third, setting setting science-based targets that have this kind of voluntary targets. I think these are three areas that, that are you know important this year. And, and in that regulatory part, of course, setting a price is, is one one. And I think that is that that to me is is, is perhaps a more viable way for to to create the innovation spaces for for decoupling and, and, and innovation. But there's a lot we can you know, many ideas there. Then when it comes to to um, the, the second question on, um, on on how far circularity can go, well that that is a I think that is really at the research frontier. This is a, a big question. I mean I I think there's increased evidence that uh, that uh, recycling or having circular business models for many of the rare earth metals in particular starts making economic sense already today but would make even more economic sense if you put a price on on the negative externalities of of those products so it's not only about a price on carbon it's putting price on other natural capitals as well and then but 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 the question is can we be, be, we can, of course, never be 100% circular. So I think, I think a lot of your questions uh, land in something that I have not mentioned yet, but I do agree that um, in, in most assessments, if not all, we can only succeed with a transformation that delivers to the Paris Agreement by also having behavioral change. Behavioral change is always one wedge in, in all these assessments. So it's not as if we can just go on as usual, and just believe that everything is, is circular and, and zero carbon. There will there will be a, a kind of a, a dematerialization, a more service oriented behavior. I mean, difference in behavior in terms of transport. So th there will be a need for changes there as well. I'm not so enthusiastic or convinced so far on CCU, to be honest. I think um, a bit like the question earlier that photosynthesis is such an incredibly efficient carbon capture system. Why go CCS? Well, you could say the same way with CCU. 
I mean, we have so much biology that is fantastic in taking up carbon dioxide and then transform that to very useful fibers and uh, biomass and uh, protein. So, so I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I, I I've been very impressed by by some of the experimentations done on CCU, but uh, but we're talking about such massive amounts of carbon dioxide that needs to be sucked up in the atmosphere. I think plugging it back to where it came from through CCS, I think is um, is, is a more plausible path. But but again, I, I I'm I'm very open to be proven wrong there. Well, thank you very much. I think we reached the end of our seminar. I I, I have a, another so many questions, uh, but. Uh, just for the sake, thank you everybody for staying uh, with us. Let me just conclude with a reminder on, uh, I will try to put some answers to your questions on AI. If I had to choose one thing to say is that we are less worried looking at the latest data when it comes to electricity and energy consumption of the ICT, despite the exponential growth of telecoms and data um, and edge computing and data centers, we are all with these major players in touch and all our incentives are aligned. So I see that there will be a progress because there is a progress in computing, that we do computing with less energy. There is a progress in cooling. There is a progress in the software, in the telecoms and the fiber. So in a way we can keep it in check when it comes to energy consumption of running the ICT system. <laughs> What is more problematic, and I repeat what already Gerard said, is the material inefficiency and circularity. And there is the consumption. And since I am working on several societal challenges, and one that I know best is uh, where I worked 25 years is health. Looking at health and aging and security and migration and climate and whatever societal challenge you want to call it, there is one fundamental common denominator, and that is individual behavior change. So this is the holy grail of all researchers, politicians, stakeholders when Come dealing in. with societal challenges. And that is something that uh, we ended up with and we need to and we need to all address. So and that's in the heart of uh, SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. It's not them, it's us the solution. So leaving that uh, with you and uh, pointing you again to the website until next time and uh, next lecture. Thank you very much for your presence. Thank you very much, Johan, for being with us. Thank you, Andrea, yeah, thank, for thanks, running yes, the show. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye.